Children's Church and uh, Nursery. If you'd like to turn with us this morning, we're going to be reading from uh, the book of 2 Thessalonians, uh, 2 Thessalonians, the third chapter. Uh, 2 Thessalonians, the third chapter. And uh, we had a thought this week it would be good and tired. Good and tired. Does anybody ever get tired? I mean, if I were to ask you this morning, by looking out on this, this wonderful crowd with all the, the many smiling faces, if I were to ask you, how many people in here are tired this morning? Probably most people say, I am tired. Which is an amazing thing considering we just got up a few hours ago and, and we're already tired. So either one, that means we don't rest good, or two, that means we've done a lot of work between sunrise and now, which I doubt that would be the case, but we'll just go with it anyway and give folks the benefit of the doubt. We get tired, don't we? We get so tired of, of all the things of this world. We get tired of being busy. We get tired of the routine. We get tired of, 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 of all the things. I mean, we're just constantly going, 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 and, and it seems like the, the little mouse in the wheel never stops spinning, does it? It's always running, always going. You ever get tired of doing good? You ever wonder why you're doing good? Why? What's the effort? What's the payoff at the end of it? I mean, I do. I'll just be honest with you. There's, there are times in my life that I've gotten to the point where I've said, Lord, I just don't understand why. I mean, it's like I'm beating my head against the wall. It seems like no matter what you do, no matter how much you go, no matter what you try to do or to uh, say, it seems like it's never enough. It has no effect. You're always just, and I'll be honest with you, there's times when I get up here and preach, it's like whenever I get done, I could have honestly been preaching to a wall and probably felt about the same way about it. And I'm not blaming you, it may have been me. But that's just the way it goes. But in, but in 2 Thessalonians, the third chapter, the 13th verse, Paul, and, I, and I was, I've been studying through some of Paul's writings, and as I was reading through this, this verse is, seems like a very small, insignificant verse in the grand scheme of the Bible. Okay, There's so many more things in the Bible, right? There's John 3, 16, 17, and 18. There's Romans you know, 10, 9, there's, there's all these other verses that, that seemingly scream out the power of God and how that, that the graciousness of God and then stuck over here in, in 2 Thessalonians, the third chapter, the 13th verse, is this little old verse, little old verse that says, but ye brethren be not weary in well-doing. Right. And as I was as I was studying through this, and I, and I was trying to get the grander scheme of things, I was looking at, at the, you know, I was looking at, at, at the, the falling away of the church. I was looking away at all the other things that were going on. I was looking at Paul and, and how that he was writing to them about the walk in the course and finishing the course and doing those things that they had to do. As I was reading about this, this little verse kind of just kept hammered at me. But you're not weary and well-doing. I... I had to apologize to Miss Linda this week. You know, uh, for those of you who wasn't here last week or don't know, uh, we had one of the best services uh, last week. Miss Linda came forward, gave her life to Christ. You know, she said, I, I didn't know for sure, but she said, today, I know for sure. And it was such a precious time, and, and, I, and I feel like I failed her as a pastor, and I feel like maybe I even failed a lot of you all as a pastor. Because what I should have said after all that was done was I'm not going to give Satan more credit than he's due, but be aware he's really going to try to battle you this week. Now, I don't know if any of you all have experienced that this week. I don't know if any of you all have, have that Satan has really tried to beat you down this week, but I'll tell you what, me and Miss Lena talked about it, and he's really tried on our parts. Tried to discourage, tried to knock down, tried to, tried to do a lot of things. And sometimes in doing battle, you get weary. As I was studying about why Paul was talking about do not be weary in well-doing, it seemed to me that there is a reasoning behind that. There's a logic behind what Paul was saying. And, and if, if there wasn't a reason why, Paul wouldn't have said it. So evidently, we can get tired of doing good. We can get tired of living a Christian life. We can get tired of trying so hard. We can get tired sometimes. And I think if ever there was a time that it tells that God's people are tired, today is that time because there's not an excitement. There's not a, there's not a tremendous rush to get in the house of God. There's, we, we come in the house of God, and, and unless God moves in some great and mighty way and the Holy Spirit just comes and overpowers us, then it's like, well, it was good. 
I'm glad I was at church today. Man, you know, I could, I could sit here and take a nap just as easily as I could listen to a sermon or a song. And we get weary and well-doing and we come into church and, and, and there's, no, there's no umph from us. Boy, if there was ever time that we're weary and well-doing, now's the time. The Bible tells us that we can get weary in doing good. We can get weary in following the path. But I'm going to ask you today, do you think there's a payoff in it? I do. There's been several months that went by, and, and I, can, I can tell you this, okay? And I, and I feel like I can, I can open up to you as a pastor. There were several times over the past couple years that I've, I've actually sought counsel from good godly people that I, I, that I associate with. And I said, you know what? I, said, I don't know if we're doing any good at all. I said, I might as well just give up. I said, nothing's happening. There's no movement. There's no, there's no working of the Holy Spirit. There's no stirring of the water, so to speak. There's nothing going on. I said, have I run my course? Have I, have I done all that I need to do? Am I, am I done? And you know what? I, I love it when good godly friends do this. They say nothing. They say nothing. Because you know what I'd really like for somebody to say? I'd really like for somebody to say, yep, you're done. <laughs> you're right. Give it up. Kick your feet up. Take your break. It'll be all right. But I've got good godly friends that, that, that in their counsel, they never said anything. Sometimes when people come to you for counsel, the best counsel you can give them is no counsel at all. That's a little extra that don't cost you anything extra, okay? Sometimes when people come to you and they, they want godly counsel, the best godly counsel you can give them is give them no counsel at all. It, you know, we read about that in the book of Job. And I know we're sidestepping a little bit, but... In, in the book of Job, Job had friends that came in, and he had one that came in that didn't say that, and he did a lot better than the other three that kept talking. But in the course of time, I would say, I, and God would feed little crumbs, just little things along, just little pieces, just little things. And, and it would cause me to want to stay the course, and I'd say, okay, God, evidently you're not done. I don't want to be done until you're done. I don't want to give up until you tell me it's time to give up. I don't want to ever do anything outside of your will. But I can honestly tell you, you can get weary in well-doing. That's why Paul wrote this in this book, was because the Holy Spirit gave him unction to tell us that you're going to get tired from time to time. Okay? But don't give up. Don't give up. It's okay to be tired. If you're, if you're praying with all your might and you're studying with all your might and you're giving your 100% effort, I'm going to go ahead and tell you that you cannot sustain that pace day after day after day after day without getting tired. It's impossible. Paul even got tired. You want to know something? Even Jesus got tired. We read where Jesus, you know, he went up on the mountain to get away from everybody for just a while because he needed to be refreshed. There was a time that Jesus even needed to refresh this human body because he got tired. He got tired of listening to the constant bickering of disciples who was going to be better than who and who's going to do what and who's got this and who's got that. And then there was those multitudes of people that always wanted healing and feeding and all the other things that go on. And after a while, it says that Jesus went up on the mountain. He said, hey, you all stay down here. i got to take a break for a minute. I'm wore out. And I'm going to tell you something. If you deal with folks and you deal with people, that's going to happen. Even good people will wear you out. Paul said, but brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And I was looking at some scripture. Jesus even gave us an admonishment in the 15th chapter of John. He said, as the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. Continue. Have you continued in God's love today? Or have you just got to a place where you're just sitting still? Have you got to a place where you're not continuing, you're just there? In your spiritual life, are you growing or have you become stagnant? I'm growing. Great. Because we need growth. God never saved us to sit still. God never saved us not to run the course. God never saved us to be stagnant. He saved us so that we will take his gospel message and spread it. Now, we can get tired, but we don't stop. 
You ever watch those marathons? I love watching those marathons where, where you know, you see the people and, 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 and they start off and everybody's got their pace going right and they're, and they're going. But boy, at the end of it, you know, that pace is slacked off. Them legs ain't near as high, you know, but they still got to finish the race. You know, I, I don't know if any of you all seen the clip this week, but I felt so sorry for the poor lady. There was some kind of big marathon going on, and this motorcycle policeman was driving through town, and he was leading them on. This woman had like 100 yards on the second-place runner, and he was leading them through the course, and she was running behind them, and he veered off course so that she could finish the line, and she took off after the motorcycle. And the second-place runner kept going straight. And by the time she realized she had veered off course, she came in third. I said, that'd be my luck. That'd be my luck, man. Norton's law really applied to this woman. <laughs> and, and she got off course. And sometimes we as God's people do the same thing. Amen. We think we're headed the right direction. We think we're doing the right things. We think we're doing this. But we get off course sometimes. Can I admonish you this morning? Don't get tired. Don't give up. That woman could have said, you know what? I'm done. I messed up. I followed the wrong thing. I did the wrong thing. I just quit. But no, she just turned back around, ran back the other way, got back on course, and finished the race. Now, maybe she didn't finish first, but she finished her race. How many people in this congregation this morning may have felt like because of things you've done or maybe veered a little bit off course that you're done with your, your race? And the Lord is saying, you're not done with your race. Just get back on course. Amen. Don't get tired. Don't give up. Just get back on course. Don't let the circumstances of the world knock you around to the point where you're not willing to get up. Paul said, don't get so tired you give up. Finish your course. Matter of fact, Paul didn't say it once, but he said it twice in the book of Galatians. He warned them again. He said, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So in due season. Okay, I'm going to ask you a question. How many people in here pray, and if you don't get the answer within a couple of days, you give up? I prayed about it. Okay. Lord, please save them. Well, they didn't get saved today at church. They went there. I guess we ain't, they ain't no hope for them. They're, they're, don't really pray, keep praying for them. They're, they're bound for hell because they didn't come today. What we need to do is realize that there is a season. There is a planting season, and there is a reaping season. Amen. Now, a good gardener knows, and anybody that's ever tried to garden anything knows, that in between planting and harvesting, there's a whole lot of work that goes on between those two. Now, if you give up anywhere along the line, there's a good chance when it comes time to harvest, you don't harvest much because you didn't work it out. We in instant gratification society have gotten to the place where we want to plant today and get tomorrow. If we wanted to grow a forest, we want to stick an acorn in the ground today, and tomorrow we're going to come back expecting to see an oak tree. We get weary because we take too much time with ourselves. What we need to do is start making things for people, completing, quit the competing. That's when we get off. Well. But we got to remember that we have got to stay the course. Are you staying the course? Are you finishing your race? Are you doing what you should do? Are you, are you motivated to finish? You know, but oftentimes it's like, well, if it happens, it happens, right? How many people here have prayed for their family members? How many people here have seen the completion of those prayers? So many times I have watched people come and pray, and I use this example, and I never will forget. Uh, you know, the Lord allows us to witness things in our life. Miss Ruby told her, I, I love Ruby to death. She's a great woman and a godly woman that goes up to Island Ford, love her to death. And I can remember as a kid, she used to, she used to ask for a prayer request for her husband. And she would get up every, every Sunday, never failed without fail, for years. 
I watched this go on 10, 15 years maybe. As I was growing up, she would say, my husband's a truck driver. Please pray for my husband that my husband will get to come with me to church and he will get to know the Lord and, and, and everything all good. Can I, can I tell you how that ended up, okay? Can I share with that how that ended up? And Dave, God rest his soul, was a good man. I love Dave to death. And Dave and I got ordained on the same night. After years of prayer, after years of not giving up, after years of requesting prayer, after years and years and years of saying, hey, pray for my husband, pray for my husband, pray for my husband. He got ordained as a deacon the same night I got ordained as a minister. See, that taught me the power of not giving up. Now, at any point, she could have got tired and said, you know what, it's not worth it. I, I, I've prayed for 10 years. I've prayed for five years. I've prayed for two years, and it ain't worked out so far, so I, if, evidently it ain't God's will. And that's where we get weary and that's where we give up. In the book of Hebrews, the 12th chapter, it says, Wherefore, seeing we are also, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which so doth easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. There is so much in that one verse that I could preach for all afternoon just out of that one verse. But so many times we get so beset by a side of ourselves because of all the things of the world that we have allowed to influence our world. Can I ask you today, are you farther along in your Christian walk than you were a year ago? Are you closer to the Lord in your Christian walk than you were a year ago? If you're not, do you see a problem with that? The Bible tells us and compares this life to a race. It compares this life to making progress. It compares this life to being propelled forward. And I'm going to ask you this question, and, and you don't have to answer me because it, you want to answer it uh, honestly inside of your own heart. Is But are you closer now than you was a year ago? Our relationship is like this. If you're not closer, if you're not closer, then why are you not closer? Because you've allowed some weights or sins or circumstances or people or things to come between you and God. You've allowed things to come into your life that is separating you from your race. You're allowing things to come into your life, and you're letting them uh, separate you from the course that you've been on. Well, it's his fault, her fault, their fault, my boss's fault, my wife's fault, my husband's fault, somebody else's fault, my kid's fault, anybody's fault but mine. And as, as he was writing to the book, in the book of Hebrews, he said, listen, it's our job to lay aside those things that are hindering us, to get rid of those things that are bothering us, to move away from those things that are holding us back. And I'm going to ask you today, what is holding you back? You say, well, Brother Andrew, are you telling me I get to divorce my wife or my husband? No. I'm telling you, you've got to examine yourself, see where you're at. I'm going to ask you to examine yourself, see where your heart's at. Do I get to kick my kids out of the house? Do I get to do all those things? No. Well, unless you want to. I'm not talking about my kids. And, you, and we, we look at these things and we say, well, they're holding me back. They're holding me back. Oftentimes, we look at the circumstances and say, well, that's holding me back. When really, in reality, it's not the circumstances holding us back. It's ourselves and the way we're looking at it. I've not got enough... I've not got enough. I've not got, I've not got enough money. I've not got enough time. I've not got enough opportunity. I've not got enough of these things. And that's holding me back. And the whole time it's saying, well, God, I, I can't worship you. I can't be closer to you because of all these things. What that tells me is that we've placed the importance on the wrong things. If you, can't, if you can't get closer to God because of your wife or your husband, that tells me that you're allowing your wife or your husband to get in the way between you and God. If you're letting your children come between you and the Lord and you're closer to the Lord, you're letting your children take the place of God. I've known people that's even let their church work take the place of God. Well, I'm so busy at church that I can't even, I can't even worship. I can't even enjoy myself anymore. If that's the case, well, then will you do me a favor? Will you please stop? If it's got to the place where you work so hard in church that you can't enjoy church, please stop. And get to the place where you can enjoy your service to the Lord and get on your course with God and finish your course with joy. Lay aside the ways and the sins that does so easily beset you and then follow God. Because if not, here's what's going to happen. You're going to suffer and you're going to get tired. I got a book laid on my desk at work. And I really laid it there for a conversation piece because it's really interesting to see how much conversation that, that it, it, it starts. But it's called Zeal Without Burnout. Zeal Without Burnout. And it talks about 
how to live our life as Christians with passion for Christ. I want to ask you today, do you have a passion for Christ? Are you passionate about it? There's probably things you're passionate about. There's probably things that, that get you torqued up. I'll guarantee you. I, I would, if I was the type of man that bet, I would bet on this. That within the next couple of months, there's probably going to be people inside of this building that will find themselves mad or screaming because of a UT football game. I'm just saying. I'm not saying they're going to have a good or bad season. I'm just saying somebody in here is going to be upset one way or the other or torqued up or whatever you want to call it. And you know what is the amazing thing to me? And I, I've, sat, I've sat at these ball games, I've sat at a UT ball game, I've sat at a high school football game, and I have watched people stand up, and I've watched people shout, and I've watched people scream, and I've watched people, I mean, just get plumb beside themselves. I've seen people high five. I mean, I've seen people hug neck, even tears come out of people's eyes. This is the greatest thing ever. And you know what? I wish we could get the same thing in church. I wish we could get people to have the same passion for Christ in church that people do for football games. Because if you did, then can you imagine what our church would be like? If we had the same passion for church and Christ that we do for football or baseball or fishing or whatever else is your thing, can you imagine what church would be like today? But instead, what we get a lot of times is, preacher, you ain't going to get nothing more than this out of me. It's okay, because it's not my job to get that out of you. It's my job to preach you the word. It's your job to examine your life of Christ. Because here's what I can't do. I can't come back here, and I can't grab anybody's arm and twist it and make you any closer to Jesus. I can't play mercy with you and make you any closer to Jesus. I can't kick you and make you any closer to Jesus. I can't love on you. I can't hug your neck. I can't do anything to make you any closer to Jesus until you want to be closer to Jesus. All I can do is preach you the word. And as I look out this morning, you know, we, 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 did we spend all of our, did we spend all of our energy last week? I, I, it was kind of funny. I, I was, I left here last week and man, that was a good service, was it not? That was a great service. And I left here and, and I was telling people about the service we had. I said, man, that was a great service. I said, man, we, you know, you don't have those. And, and I found myself saying this very word. We don't have those very often. And I thought to myself, well, that's a sad statement. That's a sad statement, ain't it? We don't have those very often. Yes. I mean, we have them, but we don't have them. And, and, and trust me, folks, I'm glad we have them, okay? Then I would really worry if we never had them. But I said, you know what? If we could only have them more often. To have them more often means we have to crave it. You know, and, and I tried to go back and examine everything that happened in last week's service. And, and, and there was a few things that stood out to me, okay? So here's, here's the elements that I found that, that, was, that was different from our normal church services. One, it started on Saturday at the men's prayer breakfast, okay? And you say, well, what did the men's prayer breakfast have? That, because we had people who got together to pray. Now, the women do a great job in their, in, their, in their prayer life, their stay life together. They do a great job. But what amazed me was that you know, us as men, we got together and we prayed. That was different than what we normally do. So that tells me that it got the men, and I'm going to lay it squarely on our shoulders, if we'll get together and we'll pray more, then we can see more happening, okay? Let's don't let the women take responsibility for all of it. Men, we get together, we need to pray more, and that'll make a difference. Also, we came in, and time meant nothing. From the time we started, I remember Kay saying, hey, listen, I know this ain't the time, but I don't care. i got to sing. Okay? So when we stop programming ourselves into what we do, and we start saying, okay, Lord, then it's up to you. you, you if you want me to sing now, I'll sing now. If you don't want me to sing now, I won't sing. If you don't want me to preach, I ain't going to preach. But whatever it is, Lord, I want you to be in charge of this. Amen. Then it makes a difference. There was people here that was primed to hear the gospel. And, thank the Lord, he provided the message. Because, like I told you, when I got up last week, I didn't have a thing. I didn't know anything about what I was going to preach on. I, I had barely 
got a scripture. And I was like, okay, Lord, I don't know which direction you're going to head with this, but God, you know exactly what you want. And he did know exactly what he wanted. But here's the thing about it is, if we crave that, if we want more of it, then we got to be more serious about it. And not be weary in it. Not get tired of it. Not let it pass by. We should look forward to each and every opportunity that we have to come and worship the Lord. Lord, I'm just glad that I got to come in today. I'm glad I got to be in the house of the Lord. I'm glad that I got to proclaim your name. God, I'm glad I got to, I got to praise you. God, this is a great opportunity. God, you, you are magnificent. You are wonderful. You are our almighty, our counselor. The song that we sing, that worthy of worship. Did you, did you ever listen to the words of that? Almighty Father, Master Lord, Redeemer, Sustainer, Comforter, Friend. God, you are all that and more. And God, I love you so much. I might get tired of a lot of things, God, but I'm not going to get tired of serving you. God, I'm not going to be weary in my well-doing. God, I want to keep going one more time. I don't know if you all have ever seen the movie Hacksaw Ridge. I'm going to ask if they will come and get a song. It's a movie about a man named uh, Desmond Doss. And it's a war movie about this man that was conscious as objector in World War II. And he wanted to find his place to serve. And in the course of his service, he became a medic because he wouldn't pick up a gun. He wouldn't, he wouldn't kill nobody. He wouldn't fire a gun. But he, he found his, his place as a medic. And he was on one of the, in the, one of the worst battles that there was in World War II in Peleliu. And he, and he, his prayer was, and, and they did an interview with him after the movie, and they actually had his true words. He said, I just kept praying, God, give me one more person. Let me help one more person. He said, my hands was bloody and raw from lowering the rope down. He said, I was wore out. He said, I was tired. He said, I was being shot at. And he said, the only thing that kept coming to my mind was, God, let me help one more person. Give me strength to help one more person. The reason I tell you that is not to, not to sell you on the movie. The reason I tell you that is that's the way we should be in our spiritual life is, God, if I get tired, if I get worn out, if I get in trouble, God, give me strength to help one more person. God, just one more person. If it's just one more, then give me the strength to do that. God, if I can be a help to anybody else, let me do that. God, if I can, if I can serve you in any other way, let me do that, God. Just give me strength. Sustain me. God, just sustain my strength and let me not be weary in well-doing. Because I'm good and tired, but I'm not done. I'm not done. This morning, if you're here and you need strength, if you're here and you have went to the end of your rope, if you're here and you say, you know what, I'm ready to throw in the towel, I'm done with it, I'm, 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 I've made it to the, to the end of my rope. I've dealt with whatever it is for so long and I just can't deal with it no more. Can I invite you to come and pray? Can I invite you to come and let God renew your strength? Can I invite you to come and let him renew you up and mount you up like on wings of eagles this morning as the Bible teaches us? As we stand and as we sing this morning.